Um, I have the honor of uh, introducing uh, someone that is, has become a, a dear friend for several years and has been doing wonderful work at Bank of America. The work is personal for her. Um, she understands what's happening across the country. And because of her style of leadership, she has wonderful relationships with local market executives. And many of those executives are now going to be joining the committees as well uh, in our local market. So I am delighted to call her a friend, uh, grateful for Bank of America's commitment to our program as one of our founding uh, sponsors. In fact, we have Andrew Plepter on our board. And what that means is really commitment to the growth of the program. We're a six-year-old program, so we're pretty young still at the Aspen Institute. And then to take a risk in this program, um, to see the Aspen City Learning and Action Lab grow, because we're already recruiting that second cohort of cities, and I'm really grateful for that and for her leadership. Um, I hope she will talk about Banks of, Bank of America's $1.2 billion commitment. And if I increase the number, it's on purpose, because I think you should do more. Uh, there's a lot of work in the community, and we're really grateful. So please give a warm welcome to Angie Garcia Lathrop, Market Executive, Bank of America. <laughs> Hello. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be with you. I'm going to get away from the podium. This is um, my second in-person event of the day. Oh my gosh, what a, I feel so good. Do you guys not just feel good to be around people and like hugging people and like thinking about evening plans and getting together and creating your own communities, the communities that we create when we get out from behind our desks. Um, so it's a real honor to be with you all. Dominica, I appreciate you bringing us together in person. Um, I just wanna thank you for the leadership that you bring to this program. Um, we're such, it's an honor for the bank to be part of it, but it's, it's really an honor to see you grow and develop this program, take it even further as Aspen really invests in what does, what is Latinos in society mean from the Aspen Institute? And so honor to be working with you to um, do what we can do to help you grow and the program grow. Dominica just recently accepted an invitation from the bank to join our National Community Advisory Council. That's a council. That's a council of leaders like you that are interested in what we do as a company and helping bring your expertise and talent and voice um, to sit down with our executives and advise us. Um, learn about what we're doing as a company and advise us on how we can do it better. Um, do it more, you know, connect better with our customers, connect better with the communities in which we work and live in, um, um, connect with our associates, with employees like me, um, and do right by me um, and other teammates of mine. And Dominica's going to lend her time and talent to that council and I think help us really grow as a company. So I um, appreciate you for, for that, Dominica, so much. Um, why is Bank of America interested in this program? Uh, it really stems from an interest in believing in the power of connections. In fact, Bank of America's motto is, we believe in the power of connection. Um, and we believe in it so much because connections, you never know where a connection is going to take you. Um, and it's, it's hard to invest in connections. But when Dominica told us about this model, which is really derived from the research of the last five years of the, of the program, um, it's kind of, you kind of got to go with a leap in a faith, a little bit of faith in, um, in leadership um, and the idea of there being a power to every connection. Um, and I've, I was talking to Laura at my table from El Paso. I don't know if Laura's sitting, there's Laura. And about like, so what does it mean to be connected locally? What does it mean to create an ecosphere of Latino business owners? Um, and she gave me the most beautiful answer. I told her that you were, she said you might order another drink ticket tonight, Dominica. <laughs> she said that in her community and at the table, it connected the allies that already existed, but brought them all together at a table to talk about where they can go next. And from that came an outcome um, of, of applying for the EAD program? EDA, EDA program, thank you. 
Um, an outcome, in six months, they've already built the connections, identified where they want to go, and taken action. It truly is an action lab. And that is why we're here, because that's what we believe in, that, that you just don't know what that next connection will bring you. Um, we hope that you will think about Bank of America as a place to connect, but we know that there is a power of just bringing people together, people that care about an end goal. Um, allies in your community. So I wish all of you from all different markets, from El Paso to um, Baltimore to, oh, name another one, please help me, Miami, San Francisco, <laughs> Chicago, San Antonio, <laughs> San Bernardino, thank you, Phoenix. Um, so I just wish you all the luck in creating what your moment is um, and you know, really taking action upon it. Um, and I wish you the most success in that. And that's why the bank is here. We believe in the power of connection. Our $1.25 billion commitment, which Dominica accurately described, we could raise it though. Um, over the next five years, a piece of that is focused on entrepreneurs and small business development. And we are investing in the success of Hispanic, Latino entrepreneurs and small businesses. So this is one way of doing it. There will be other ways, um, of course, through CDFIs and through minority-owned institutions. Um, but this is a powerful one where each of you really own your next step and your next success. So a best of luck. Thank you for allowing me to talk with you today. Um, thank you, Dominica. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Christine Gloria. I am the Director of Artificial Intelligence with Aspen Institute, and I'm so very happy to um, be here with all of you, and I've, we've had the pleasure of collaborating very well with Dominica and the rest of the Latinos in Society team. So I'd like to welcome the rest of the panel to the stage, and I'll do a brief set of introductions, then we'll get right into the discussion. All right, and everyone can hear me just okay? All right, wonderful. Okay, so briefly, I'd like to go ahead and introduce everyone and give them an opportunity to, you know, say hi, uh, their name and their affiliation, and then we've got a bunch of questions that we'd love to get into. Um, and, oh yeah, Raul is here. And uh, we are doing the hybrid version of today's panel, and welcome uh, Raul um, from, the Knight Foundation. Well, do you want to just quickly say hi and then we'll come to everyone here at live? Hey folks, really appreciate you all accommodating me virtually. Uh, travel is still, a, is still a consideration on, on our end. I love the fact that hopefully my head is larger than Hector uh, in real life. <laughs> I'm getting a massive kick out of this, you have no idea. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all even virtually. Uh, my name is Raul Moas. I am the program director for Knight Foundation here in South Florida, Greater Miami. Our focus as a foundation in the region is promoting tech and entrepreneurship. Uh, and we've been at that for the better part of 10 years and, and thrilled to see the way that Miami as, as, a, as a region and as a people uh, are, are coming to the forefront in the national discourse. Thank you so much, Raul. And yes, your head is larger than Hector's and I can <laughs> hopefully see you. So if, if you have, if you want to jump in, please just uh, pull up a finger. And to my right, I have Hector Mojica. Is that, yeah. yeah. All right, Hector, right. you want to uh, introduce yourself quickly to everybody? I'm happy gonna... to, happy to. Um, first of all, I'm Raul's better half, uh, also <laughs> from Miami, so we get to, to the joys of sharing that ecosystem together. Um, my name is Hector Mujica. I lead economic opportunity for Google.org, which is Google's philanthropic arm, where I have the great privilege of finding ways to advance the inclusion of historically underrepresented and marginalized communities in pathways to the digital economy. We've worked with many groups here, so I'm deeply humbled and thankful that, I, that, that we get to add our voice to this, to this conversation. Dominica, thank you so much for your partnership over the years, and thank you for all you guys have been doing alongside of us to, to help advance the dialogue and the discourse, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Hector. And to, uh, to his right, we have Lily Gangas. 
Thank you so much for, for the warm welcome. It's great to see Hector. Uh, <laughs> and talking about uh, that ecosystem, right? I think it's really important. So glad that we're here. And my heart is warm because I love to hear technology everywhere we go. And the reason why is because my role at the Caper Center, uh, which is a foundation focused on increasing pathways for in tech and tech entrepreneurship and tech investment uh, for black, Latinx, and indigenous community. My role there is specifically the chief tech community officer. So my role is to be here with you all and encourage you all to make sure that you're seizing all the opportunities, specifically all the ownership opportunities that technology mm -hmm. can bring. And so um, I'm really excited to be here. I'll share a little bit more about some of the, the tech landscape data. We just partnered with, with Aspen Latinos on specifically uh, creating a, the latest data on Latinx and tech. So we'll be sharing a little bit more about that. Thank you, Lily. And um, finally, but not, uh, not least, most important, uh, Marcella uh, Escobar Alava. Uh, hi everyone, uh, Marcella, and a new resident to DC. So I'm currently serving as the, I have a really weird long title. Uh, right now my badge says Deputy CIO, but I'm the Special Assistant to the President and Deputy Director of Technology for the White House. Uh, first time in federal government, first time serving, and uh, prior to that have a long standing history in leading uh, organizations through digital transformation, uh, most notably uh, Sony Pictures was the CIO there, uh, moved them through their kind of full from uh, growth to plateau through decline of the home entertainment uh, industry into the digital business. So that was uh, wonderful and then um, got pulled into the nonprofit at one point, uh, so led the Hispanic Scholarship Fund's digital transformation as well there. And uh, lastly, we spent uh, about three and a half years at a mid-sized company, a uh, small business, not business, medium-sized business, uh, doing their digital transformation in the construction and commercial uh, landscape industry. And have also, you know, I was, I was trying to think, like, how do I really fit into this panel? And <laughs> have also owned uh, three restaurants, grew up in a family uh, run a uh, restaurant for a really long time and um, tried to franchise and uh, have had a party store staffing company. So I have all these weird, uh, <laughs> random um, <laughs> entrepreneurial <laughs> ventures. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think I do fit. So I have some perspectives to share with everyone. So I'm really excited to be here. And thank you, Dominique, as well, for the invite. Um, and also grateful for the Aspen Institute because of them and their vision to bring in people from the private sector into the public sector uh, via the Aspen Technology Hub, I was able to uh, land this amazing opportunity that I have today. Amazing. Thank you. And I love hearing, again, connecting the dots through all of the Aspen uh, programs. So I want to, uh, first, some housekeeping. I, we are going to try to cover as much as we can um, in a very short period. But if you have some burning questions or you, if we miss something, please, uh, for those in the room, I invite you to write down your questions on a card. And we'll um, take them at the end and uh, try to address as many. For those who are watching virtually, hello, um, please <laughs> use the Chime. Uh, I believe it's the Chime app for the Q&A. And we will also uh, take those down so we can make sure to get the panelists to answer. So um, I think, where should we start? There's a lot to start here. I think uh, we've realized that there are a lot of different um, gaps and challenges, uh, specifically for the Latino community in not just tech entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship and small business in general. Um, but for this panel, we're going to focus on digital inclusion and um, the technology gap. So I, I wanted, Lily mentioned a little bit about it. I want her to give us a bit of, drop some, drop some knowledge on us, Lily, <laughs> on what are some of the, the trends and key um, uh, stats that you would say about the landscape right now. Sure, and I, I like to start all these talks by saying we are all tech now, okay? <laughs> if there's one thing right. that we're gonna leave uh, with COVID is that we gotta understand that we are already in part of this industry in different formats. So for anybody that doesn't feel that they're welcome in these spaces, we are welcome you because we are already part of it. And for me, it's a really personal story as well because I personally know what it's like to, to have the opportunity, that upward economic mobility that technology can bring. So my story is very similar, hopefully, to some of yours, an immigrant, single parent, proud Bolivian. Uh, but I started electrical engineering undergrad, and I was in the, uh, listening to the prior session that was talking about all the pathways and how we get, kind of get tracked, right, into who gets to be an engineer or not. And so for me, I was very fortunate that I was able to discover that pathway because I didn't understand English. 
math was my universal language. And so I do want to re uh, reiterate that because of the power of education, but also being able to own our journeys and making sure that we're really realizing them. And with that said, you know, you, we see all the stats that we see that I'm, we're not supposed to be in this room as a Latina electrical engineer, software <laughs> engineering, and then what am I doing in philanthropy? Well, let me tell you why. Because I'm determined that we have to flip the ratio of the data points that we currently mm -hmm. have. So we just partnered on, on a data brief, um, and I'll just share some of the data points. So out of those 18% right of that Latinx represents in the US, which is a little bit over 60 million, why are we still only 7% of the tech workforce? And we know that that's where a lot of the new wealth is being created, a lot of the new generational wealth. Six out of 10 billionaires of this lifetime have come from tech, so why aren't we there? We're only 7% of the tech workforce. Furthermore, we're only 4% of the tech leadership. And then when you keep going down the, the pipeline, 2% of tech board members, and then 2% of the actual venture capitals, the investors that are investing in these new technologies and new companies, and then only 2% of tech startup founders. And the problem with that is that when you take a look at all the billions of dollars, close to $260 billion that went into investment to tech entrepreneurs as a Latina, we're not even a percentage represented, we're 0.4%. If that doesn't wake us all up on the opportunity that we have in front of us, what is it going to take, right? And so I just wanted to start with that conversation because I really like the urgency that we set up in the morning. And so I wanna continue that urgency because this <coughs> technology is, is pretty much all of our lives now. And we need to be partaking in that as not just the consumers, we get touted as consumers and trillion dollar opportunity. We're, we're the owners, we want to be the investors, we want to be the creators. And unfortunately, technology also has a lot of disproportional impact in our communities as we're seeing the level of misinformation, disinformation. And so when we think about the digital opportunity and digital equity, this is our new digital literacy moment of our lives. And I wanna re just reiterate that why for you as entrepreneurs, because as you've seen your, your business model, if you weren't ready for te technology, you had to adapt, right? And so entrepreneurs are the best at that. So I see a lot of opportunity for us to continue to create not only new businesses, but also new employment opportunities. So I'll pause on that because I just laid <laughs> a lot, but I hope we're all awake now and really to get engaged and talk about the solutions and the opportunities that we all have here. Thank you, Lily. Yeah, those are some really striking stats. And I think um, we have some great experts here to help address uh, what are some of the things that are happening to uh, to challenge those stats and to, like you say, flip them. I would like to bring Marcella in here real fast if, and to get your point of view being a entrepreneur who has, who's worked in non-traditional tech industries to Lily's statement about we are now all tech. What are some of the challenges and opportunities that you know people who may not consider what they're building tech oriented can can uh, understand or better uh, or kind of better address in their own businesses yeah um, it's interesting the the stats and I think like a Latina CIO is like 0.001 percent or something like that so sometimes I, I get told I'm, I'm somewhat of a unicorn but even with with my background my experience my qualifications and running businesses um, the fact that is, you know, it is technology now that, that's really driving business, driving industry, um, and driving how you create efficiencies in your, your businesses. And so we had um, a couple of restaurants, and I always follow the, I don't know if you guys have heard SMAC, um, not the drug, but <laughs> in a different context, different acronym. Uh, but I add an, an S to the end, so it's social, mobile, analytic, cloud. Um, and then add security to the end because especially now we were I think my husband and I were at a dinner table the other day with with somebody who had a, a, a law firm right and so we were I don't know what we were talking about and so I said hey I said are you are you really protecting the data for your clients and so he's like what do you mean and I said well this this and this with passwords and two-factor authentication and just making sure that you know you have your information that you could retrieve you got backups so during dinner I think I was like his wife and him who they were like oh my god she's like freaking us out what do we need to do <laughs> And he's like, well, you know, we write down our passwords on this notebook that everyone in the office shares. And I was oh, like, man. okay, oh, don't gosh. tell me that. I have a presentation. I'm going to send it to you. But even with all of that knowledge and, and having um, worked with different companies at different sizes through their digital transformation, I still found it as a, as a business owner, small business owner, ill-equipped to be able to handle it all ourselves, right? And so I think that's one of the mindsets that, yes, 
you know, especially Latino entrepreneurs, you know, they're scrappy, they, they want to, they wanna, sometimes there's something to prove, right? You know, I'm going to do it, I'm going to figure this out, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm smart, you know, I can, I can do this. But I think the key thing is you can't do it by yourself. When you're running a business, you need to be able to bring in different talents from, from different um, areas. And so even within some of the, the, the work and um, kind of the topic for, for today was, you know, what, what digital skill sets or tools do entrepreneurs need? And so I think it's beyond just trying to get that entrepreneur to be the one size fits all for everything. You need to have advisors. You need to have people that you can call on to say, hey, tell me more about you know, what my security posture should be given this type of business. OK, let's dissect it a little bit more. What are the risks that you're willing to take? And therefore, where should you be shoring up different aspects of your business? And let's spend some money and time in that area versus maybe doing a social strategy or going, hey, I'm going to cloud. OK, well, you know, what does that even mean? Do you understand what going to the cloud means for your business? And does it make sense? You know, can you start off smaller with um, tools and things that are, that are available today with like software as a service? Um, so you don't have to, you know, put a, you know, put an accounting package in a server, you know, in the construction landscape company. When we started acquiring different um, organizations, I would find servers in the bathroom near a boiler. I'm like, oh, what, what are we doing? Do we understand that all of our data just sits here that anyone has access to? And again, our company was two hundred and fifty million dollars, and we were acquiring, you know, companies that were ten million. 20 million, and these are small businesses that, again, Latinos own, and entrepreneurs, you know, say, hey, you know, I'm doing really well. I'm a multi-million-dollar company. Well, that's great, but do you understand that these practices aren't going to sustain you for very much longer? And so, and again, kind of reflecting on this, what would I need? And so, one of the the resources that I tapped into really early on, but I didn't kind of go back to it, was I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, Score, but the Service Corps of Retired Executives. And so I always think of, of having a consulting type of mentor for a small business along the way. So as you have to shift and adapt and as you have to, have to learn new things, it's really important to have kind of that mentorship uh, for your business, right? So it's not just access to capital. It's not just getting you know, a big loan from the SBA, putting your business plan in front of somebody and saying, all right, give me the, give me the funds to, to create my business. It's how do you continue to go back to that? on an ongoing basis to make sure that you're applying those new digital things that will grow your business. So there's a lot to think about. And so I don't know if there's programs like that beyond SCORE and you know, to actually like help you uh, versus giving you like spot solutions. So that's kind of my. That's great. Thank you. That's two good, great resources for everyone to check out. And I, and I love that you brought in that it doesn't, it shouldn't only be the one, it shouldn't be only on the shoulder of the one entrepreneur, right? right. This is a, all, you know, tide, all tides lift the boats, right? So I think um, it's great to dig a little deeper into both the ecosystem and the communities that need to, to also flourish in this. I'd like to bring in Raul, who is on the ground in Miami with the Knight Foundation, give us a little bit of what have you? What have your? What are you seeing in terms of the community? How, what is working? What is not? Um, and and per, potentially challenge us on what what we need to be doing better. Absolutely. So um, thrilled again to, to be with you all. And I apologize for for doing the big head on TV thing, um, but I, I appreciate y'all accommodating. So Miami Tech has has kind of had a moment in this last year. Uh, it's been normalized. The city of Miami, I think, is is the legacy of this is, is being normalized beyond the kind of almost this exotic or fetishized uh, kind of Latin enclave, it's being spoken about more and more as, as a place of American excellence, right? In, in the broader American context where Latino success kind of permeates all levels of, of community. And so rather than Latinos only being good entrepreneurs at the smaller micro enterprise level or the small and medium enterprise level, there's success across the board here. Uh, a good friend of mine announced a raise this morning uh, on his company Latino founder just raised 35 million from Tiger. Like that kind of success is becoming more normal uh, and normalized. And I think that's the legacy of what's happened here. I, I want to kind of take a, a kind of follow on to what Lily said. So Miami has about 3 million people. Uh, Greater Miami has about 3 million people. Florida International University is our largest public university in town. Um, it graduates uh, tens of thousands of folks. And the American dream is plausible because of places like FIU where higher education is accessible. Uh, to the community. About, call it five years ago, we started seeing a pickup in some of the bigger tech companies recruiting out of their computing program at FIU. 
And I think for very, just I'll call it out direct if, if y'all haven't met me, very direct, uh, for crass reasons. Um, and so logos started appearing in certain places. But what didn't really pick up thereafter was pace or scale, especially at a time when that kind of talent was in short supply and high demand, still is today. And, and I think when you peel back the onion a couple layers, it really comes down to incentives. How do the biggest tech companies recruit? How are their recruiters incentivized? I'm a recruiter for a big tech company. I'm graded, my performance is evaluated based on how many of the recruits that I bring into the pipeline make it past my supervisor's round of interviews. I don't have the luxury of making a bet on non top 20 CS programs because my performance depends on how many people I pump through the funnel. And so I constantly search for talent at quote unquote proven watering holes, essentially the top 20 CS universities or programs. And so as long as we keep expanding kind of Latino and, and racial ethnic participation in those programs, we'll make some progress, but it's gonna be that incremental progress that you end up seeing in the numbers where you go from one to 1.5 to 2% rather than really seeing single digit improvements year over year over year that add up to something significant. Why? Because places like FIU are still seen as a novelty because recruiters are not incentivized to spend time recruiting at these places and really unearthing what's there because we got to be efficient with how we do that. And so my, my, my call to, to, to everyone in, in the room is, and, and to those listening, uh, is really let's think about incentives and how do we realign the incentives here? And what are the pressure points in the systems that are holding us back that are creating these bottlenecks? It's, it's not enough to say that you don't need a four-year degree anymore to work at a big tech company, right? Because in practice, that's not really happening. What, what we really need is, is systems that, uh, and that align incentives and that reward exploring in different parts of America, that reward exploring and searching and giving opportunity in, in geographies that historically have been, have been removed because they weren't top 20 or didn't meet some sort of definition of, of excellence traditionally defined. Thank you, Raul. And, uh, you know, the... the the topic of incentive can cross cut many different uh, areas, right? It is in the hiring, it's also in what I'm about to turn to Hector to, the capital side. <laughs> and I think we all, uh, at least the stories of what is an incentive for a VC or for investment in um, entrepreneurs tends to not be on the entrepreneur's uh, uh, side right it's it's obviously for the vc so they can make the money but I'm, I'm curious like to that end are there what what have you guys thought about at google and in, in, in trying to evaluate the companies that you're that you'd like to invest in are there different incentive metrics what are some of those things that you guys have thought about and particularly how is that helpful or not with this community yeah so you know first of all again thank you for having me and thank you for allowing me to be part of this conversation um i'm privileged to be along such great colleagues and, and thought leaders in the space. You know, we tend to think about this topic often in two frames at Google, at google.org. There's a lack of access to capital, there's a lack of access to skilling or tech proficiency within the entrepreneurial or SMB ecosystems that we really need to be paying attention to. Some signals that to me continue to be quite inspiring are the facts that in spite of some of these challenges around a lack of access to capital, a lack of access to digital skills, Latino businesses are still growing, they're still booming, they're still the single community group that is outpacing every other community group in terms of new entrepreneurs, new small businesses, which is great, that's a great signal. On the flip side, we still also have to acknowledge the fact that, to Lily's point, Latinos make up 20 about 20% of this country's population, yet only about 2% in venture capital. There's a huge delta there. We also have to acknowledge that digital skills are often lacking in Latino communities. We know that, again, while Latinos make up about 20% of the population, they also disproportionately are represented in the communities that lack at least a basic level of digital skills. By, by several percentage points. And to me, that's a, that's a big flag because we also have to recognize that in moments like these, when we're coming on the other side of a global pandemic, the companies that survive, the small businesses that survive, the entrepreneurs that were able to thrive over the last 18 months are the ones that are tapping into those digital skills, into that digital proficiency to shift their business models and to be more in tune and adaptable to what the environment, to what the economy is demanding out of them. 
any, any, any chance that we have to be able to help drive greater proficiency and greater skills for those populations, I think will completely disrupt the ecosystem by enabling these small businesses, by enabling these entrepreneurs to have greater, greater access to the right skills, the right tools, to Marcella's point, whether it be around security, whether it be about cloud servers, what have you, that, that are gonna propel them to be the, the, the economies of tomorrow. The, the second point I wanna make, also building on Lily's point, and I think I do this, this service myself, is talking a lot about the digital economy. Digital economy this, digital economy that, pathways to digital economy jobs. I kind of want to get away from that and just talk about the economy, because to your point, Lily, we, like, the economy is the digital economy. Jobs, two-thirds of jobs, by today, two-thirds of jobs require at least a baseline level of proficiency in digital skilling. Two-thirds of jobs. If you don't have that baseline, you're already excluded. No, not even to mention, to Raul's point, college degrees, whether you have a four-year degree or an associate's degree, et cetera, if you don't have a base level of digital skilling, you might not even be able to apply and be considered for a role. So I think that's another, another kind of pivotal point that we need to be paying attention to, to right now. At Google, at google.org, we're highly committed to this. We're highly committed to finding creative solutions to some of these challenges, both in the skilling side and in the access to capital side. On the access to capital front, we've been thinking proactively around how do we tap into unconventional resources for capital. So we were, at google.org, we of course have access to our philanthropic pools of funding. How do we leverage that pool of funding to encourage other funding streams, potentially return-seeking funding streams, to also put money down to get that money in the hands of Latino, black, and other BIPOC entrepreneurs? Uh, one way that we've been doing that, uh, that we did that recently was through the Grow With Google uh, fund. That was a fund that was made up of philanthropic capital to absorb some of the risk of betting on small businesses that are minority owned and return seeking capital from the Google balance sheet. So we were able to build out a fund that's over $180 million that's being deployed through OFN, through CDFIs, many CDFIs that are Latino owned, led and run to be able to get that money in the hands of small businesses immediately and do so in a way that, again, is leveraging and putting the incentives in the right place, mi mitigating the risk of, of getting that money into, into those hands, and hopefully also incentivizing government and other larger pools of funds, other return-seeking capital investors to also pursue similar avenues. We're on the skilling side, again, thinking about some of the challenges and impediments that have kept, kept skills out of the hands of Latino small business owners or Latino entrepreneurs, whether that be cultural, uh, cultural relevance when it comes to the, the digital skilling programs that we're running. Are these programs in Spanish at all? Are, they, mm -hmm. are the people that are dictating these programs or these tools, do they look and sound and rep represent the community that you identify with? Oftentimes the answer to that question is no. So how can we turn that on its head? How can we provide better tools that are more in tune with the realities of what the community is going through. And in doing so, how do we, by extension, empower those communities to be more in tune with the skills that are gonna be essential for their growth and their scale in the future? Thank you, Hector, those are great. Um, I, I would love to double tap on both, uh, two things. One is this partnership question, which we can get it to about uh, both public and private, how that could be leveraged. And I think, I'd, but I'd like to start with, um, you know, for in, in some ways, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Right, and for some entrepreneurs that who don't make this distinction that Lily made about tech is just the economy. This is just how we are. What is some of the what are some messages that you think resonate really well to get people to realize that this is a skill that they need to come across or to to take up? Right. I think again, you know, you're you're trying to build a company. Maybe you don't realize that what you need to do is look at a digital tool, and it's because that's just not in your purview. I'm curious if there's anything you guys have come across that has been successful in trying to get that message to, to entrepreneurs. I can, I can share a little bit of just an example of also just in Oakland, but we can't have the conversation about digital economy or inclusion without talking about broadband access, mm -hmm. right? And so actually a, a shout out over here to Alejandro, who's the ED for HTTP, who's been leading a lot of uh, organizations on advocacy, on making sure that we are investing in broadband access because broadband are jobs 
broadband is an opportunity for you all to also create even more companies. Um, and so I just wanted to share out, we're in the middle of a big week here in DC, right? So I'm coming from Oakland. Uh, when I came here, I was like super excited. I'm like, are they going to vote? Are they going to pass it this week? Because there's $65 billion waiting just for broadband access. There's already over $260 plus million already available in broadband access dollars, of which 40% only should be going to broadband itself, the actual infrastructure, which means 60% is left for tech workforce dollars. Those dollars that you need to invest in the digital upskilling of your communities, that's already available. Just in California, there's $6 billion that just passed, again, for broadband, right? And so if there's one big issue, and I remember just reflecting on, on, on COVID right in, in, in Oakland, and I remember I'm like, if there's one thing I can do in this world, it's like, we have to close the digital divide. Mm -hmm. I, when I, I've been talking, I've been hearing about the competitive crisis, the broadband, the digital divide since I was an undergrad over 20 years ago. At USC, I was already, I already was taking classes online, engineering classes online. I had public Wi-Fi that the university provided. So why are we 20 years later still talking about the same issue? Right? And so this is the moment that we all have to partake. It's going to take advocacy. It's going to take opportunity for entrepreneurs to start here. And so it's, and I'll fast forward to why specifically Oakland, because I've been able to be on the ground in Oakland. So I've actually been working with the city of Oakland on technical advisement on the infrastructure. What does middle mile look like? What does uh, state own look like? And why does that matter? Again, these are jobs and these are opportunities for you all to be part of that economy, right? Be able to start your companies. And I would say that um, also the peak of, co uh, the peak of COVID we did a um, summit for entrepreneurs of color. And if you had broadband access, great. You were good. <laughs> the ones that were able to come in, one of the key things that they wanted, that they wanted more help on was one, understanding how do, how do you pivot? What's the strategy for their business? Mm -hmm. Maybe some businesses are just not meant to exist and it's okay to close. Go ahead and go on to your next one. And so there was a lot of need on that. There was also, again, payment, point of sales, digital marketing and metrics. Um, being able to also understand security, because there's one thing of getting folks the access and then adopting, but if we're also putting them at harms and not being able to uh, properly protect their IP, protect their data, protect mm -hmm. their customers, we're also setting them up for failure. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's something really critical that we have to make sure. And I would love to see with all these dollars that I mentioned, these are all very times to be creative on how to apply them to build these inclusive tech ecosystems that we've been wanting. Now the opportunity is here. And so programs like this and discussions like this allows us to share that knowledge and opportunity. And I would also just say that I think going back to the education side, that 7%, right? If you think about who was disconnected, at least in California, at the peak of COVID, more than 25% uh, of students were disconnected. They couldn't even go to school at all. Half of those were students of color. And when you think of California, what is the majority of population? There are kids, right? And so they're missing out on a year-long opportunity of education. What does that say even when you go further down the chain? So I just wanted long answer to your <laughs> question. Um, I think it's an integrated strategy. I think there's an opportunity here for a lot of different types of businesses to enter um, in the moments now. And so I think also just advocating on better um, opportunities to change some of the requirements when you're working with the city. So if you're working with your local city, get some more flexible um, uh, opportunities there. I think we need to make sure that we're changing some of those rules so more people can partake, more entrepreneurs can partake in building that new infrastructure. That's great, Lily. I, 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 let's go into that um, discussion about what role people within local governments, gov uh, federal government, um, and partnerships uh, can do to help support the communities. Does anyone want to take a uh, jump into what is a one what's a good way to approach that right if you're like in Lily's uh, role want to be helpful who do you approach and then as a as a uh, local official or or someone who is in the government what are some of the things that we should ex want them to to help out with so I like when I had our small business, um, I would have loved for somebody at the city to actually look at my balance sheet and look at my P and L. Mm. You know, where is my money going? Um, you know, permits, licenses, uh, health department repairs. <laughs> I mean, there was just um, a whole list of things that really needed to be addressed from a small business. So, you know, you have, and I used, I think we were using QuickBooks so again. We had like a you know an online digital platform. We had. Um, 
set up for you know online POS and um, have, we're using all of kind of the new tools to do um, like digital type ordering like Grubhub and things like that. So, so you know I felt like we were really uh, positioned there, um, but then you know the city really didn't understand kind of the concerns right. And in, in these were in Los Angeles and they were kind of pushing to help um, you know vendors in the street you know, sell mm. food and I'm going, oh my God, I've got to pay rent, I've got to pay utilities, right, insurance, all of the overhead really that, that burdens, especially a brick and mortar um, establishment versus a digital uh, establishment. We fortunately, unfortunately, didn't have the restaurant pre-COVID and now, you know, reinventing yourself, right? So now there's all these ghost kitchens, right, mm -hmm. where you absolutely have to be able to understand digital platforms to be able to sell to consumers direct right and then use the delivery services and you don't have you know all of the a lot of the overhead that comes with a traditional restaurant and so being able to before someone decides you know it's okay to close your doors because it hurts um, we actually happened to finance a lot of the the funding ourselves we didn't go to traditional banks so it you know it takes a big chunk out of out of that and and, and losing a business is not the is not a great thing, and it's and sometimes it's hard to then say let's let's go ahead and start over when that's your only source of income, right? So, it's really understanding, and so how can cities, government, federal, at whatever level, really kind of help in and step in and understand the business challenges that a business owner is actually going through, and how do you help, and how do you bring in, whether it's you know board of advisors or mentorship or whatever it is to really guide a business owner through that process if they either don't have the skill sets themselves or don't have anybody on their team that they can actually hire because bringing in a security expert, mm -hmm. you know, digital expert, it's expensive, right? Um, and so how do um, people actually help? Because you want to continue to have that business living in your community, right? You know, they employ people. I don't know how many kids we've employed, you know, entry level, trained them up, provided the skill sets, yep. and then they've been able to get, you know, better and better jobs. And I feel super proud of it. but. You know, when you close the doors, you you kind of shut that off for everybody. Mm -hmm. And if I can quickly add to that, you know, I think to your point, Marcella, one thing that I think the government could be playing a role is is in that centralization of resources, because the resources are uh, they're they're out there, and you know, SCORE and a handful of other groups have been putting them in, putting them into existence. Google has a, a handful of resources we have digital coaches and across 20 cities in the US. These are like physical people that sit down with small businesses and train them on digital tools, hands-on digital tools on how to expand and leverage to, to grow their small businesses. They've been able to reach over 80,000 small business owners just in the last two years alone, pandemic included. Um, and these resources all exist in pockets, right? Um, and I think if we can go if we can go and meet the small businesses where they're at, whether that's the chambers of commerce, whether that's different groups in each locality that's engaging with the small business ecosystem and try to centralize those resources, that would be huge. We, we, we just announced two weeks ago uh, a partnership with the, the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce with Ramiro and, and Nelson. And um, that's our way. That's our way to take a bet in helping disseminate resourcing and skilling, digital skilling, through organizations that we know small businesses in our communities know and trust that they look to, but I'm sure there's still a large swath of, or of small business owners that are being left out of that ecosystem, of that conversation. How do we reach those small businesses? That could be a space for, for city governments to lead. I love that, and I think that's a great uh, semi-project if you guys need to think about something to do is how can we create a centralized repository that's trusted Right. Um, I think part of uh, to to the extent that you guys are saying is you do need to go to the community, right? So if the if the way you're presenting it is on a website that requires you to, to click a bunch of things and your community mm -hmm. isn't there quite mm -hmm. yet, then you're <coughs> missing the point, right? So um, I, I I love that idea of trying to figure out how to do that um, as maybe a project for someone <laughs> in this room. Uh, Rule, I want to I want to give you the opportunity to also answer this partnership question before we move to Q and A. And, you know, what in in your experience is a helpful and healthy relationship or partnership between communities and either philanthropic or, or um, with government to, in the entrepreneur space? Absolutely, I, I love what, what Hector was saying there about there's, there's resources out there. Um, Knight Foundation in, in South Florida is, is almost singularly focused uh, on the tech talent pipelines uh, of the region. And, and that has implications for social economic mobility and, and, and many other things. And there's two things that stand out uh, that I, I think we, we 
an, an offer that we we consider. The first is um, this idea of, of wraparound services, right? So often like we lament that, oh, if we do the hard training, the soft skills don't follow it, and we try to recreate the wheel. Like, well, if you just step back for a second, there's a lot of great mentorship organizations out there. In Miami, Big Brothers Big Sisters is, is a really strong organization that is providing a ton of mentorship at, at just a really basic human personal level uh, to, to boys and girls that are growing up in the area. What does it look like? Uh, if, if government said, well, listen, there's a pipeline of mentorship of students who have been invested in, in their overall trajectory coming out of Big Brothers Big Sisters and or name 10 other great programs in South Florida, uh, we want to be able to say, if you're interested in getting a degree in, in STEM, we got you, right? Because we know that that investment is already already has a complimentary kind of wraparound mentor or, or piece tied to it in one of these other organizations. The other thing I'd offer is when we look at, at some of the numbers coming out of the region, there's, there's stark differences between those who graduate from it with a STEM degree, a CS degree uh, in four versus six years. Overwhelmingly, the folks that are graduating with their CS degree in six years, that it takes them six years to get that bachelor's degree, are first generation and usually heavily Latino. It's because they're working all six years, usually studying full time and working full time. It's not a matter of Pell Grants. It's not a matter of scholarships. Because at the end of the day, those, those cover the academic cost, but they don't put food on the table, they don't pay for rent, they don't help with commitments to family. If we want to go further in thinking about equity and, and building kind of equity uh, in, in community, I think we need to really address this question of, of how folks show up and participate. And so I, I'd, I'd argue that there's um, it's worth looking at how we support students uh, to complete these programs and complete them in a way where they are able to also take the internships. They are able to take um, the, the, the job while they're in school, that's not just about kind of providing for family and for themselves, but also about advancing their careers. Oftentimes those things are, 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 are out ahead. I either have to choose between working full time to provide for my family, or I have to take the unpaid internship in tech that advances my career trajectory. Uh, and so I'd say that we should look at, at those, uh, the data as in terms of completion and, and graduation timelines. And, and give a boost to those who, who clearly have the skill, clearly have the ambition, the tenacity, uh, but, but in terms of their circumstances, need a little extra to help comp compete at a, at, a, at a fair playing level. And if I can add yeah. just um, two points to that, because I think what we're, we're, we're discussing is so critical, and I don't want it to get lost, especially when we're talking about cross-sector partnerships. The fact that those numbers that we, that we mentioned, right, that's the status quo. So, to, to Raul's point, how are we reinventing the wheel? How can we accelerate? There are new programs. There are these things called apprenticeships that are actually like the OG model, right? That helped us like mobilize millions of people uh, many years ago. And what, what does it look like for those to be tech-centered? Where our communities, and even this is one of the discussions we had with entrepreneurs in Oakland and in the Bay Area. Some of the ones that were like, you know what, I'm tired. I, I wanna go back and I need to like have a, a paycheck that's more safe for my family but I really want to pursue tech. So why aren't we creating more pathways also for folks to enter uh, tech roles, but through tech apprenticeships? So that's something that's definitely create, uh, has already existed, is mobilizing, but to me it's really frustrating when we have trillion dollar tech companies that are only employing like 100 apprenticeships mm -hmm. across the US. When you take a look, we need millions, right? Absolutely. And so I do want to make sure that that is my call to action for folks who are in those cross sector. And then the other part too, for foundations and government, I also want to make sure that we're creating more investors, like more funds. The first venture capital fund was an SBA loan out in Silicon Valley. And so I want to make sure that we're also moving the dialogue towards how can we get more capital into the entrepreneurs? Because a lot of the times there's a lot of mentorships, there's loans, but where's the actual investment? So how, we, how why don't we reframe our conversation in all of it and say we're investing in each other, investing in each other's growth and learning and being able to do business with each other. And so I think that I wanted to just reiterate that because those are opportunities that are cross sector uh, funded, and especially for philanthropy. And I am sitting in philanthropy. I don't even want to look at the numbers of Latinx in philanthropy. That's a whole different <laughs> discussion. But those are the folks who are limited partners in some of these funds that are the ones that are holding the money towards the investments towards the, the startups. So I just wanted to uh, bring that full circle. There. Yeah, good. Because <laughs> I, 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 Lily, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so a trend I've noticed, um, emerging managers who come from uh, ethnically or racially underrepresented groups in venture capital are launching new funds at, at, at record speed. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I've noticed that it's, it's almost, 
explicit uh, or sometimes really, really implicit, but almost nearly explicit, that if you're a, a black or, or bl brown, black, Latino, emerging VC, your LPs are implying very strongly that you have to have a black Latino thesis in that fund. And so basically, oh, you're Raul, you're from Miami, you're Latino, great, so you must be investing only in other Latino companies. And they almost dangle that as the, the, the gateway uh, for you to get their LP dollars. Um, why? Because there's a great press release there. Well, I can tell you how the story ends. In four years, returns are not going to be great. And folks are going to say, you see, we tried investing in, in folks who are underrepresented and just didn't work out. Mm -hmm. Well, you, the LP, prioritized the positive, great PR moment over the success of the fund, mm -hmm. right? And so invest in diverse emerging managers, a thousand percent. We need more that I could not agree more with Libby, but don't set them up set them up for success. Let them define their own investment thesis. Let them focus on areas of growth that they think are, are important. Um, the idea that, that Latinos can only invest in other Latinos, in my view, is incredibly offensive and destructive to the wealth creation yes. that we want to create. Mm -hmm. And if I can, I know we're running, <laughs> <laughs> I know we're running into Q&A, but I think Lily and Ro have been fired up as well. Um, <laughs> You know, I think, I think we, we at Google.org, and me personally, I'm, I'm a staunch believer in the power of cash and the power of unrestricted capital for Great. Great. businesses and for entrepreneurs. There is something there about the dignity that you give to an individual when you empower them with a check and you give no strings attached to that check. We at Google.org have been trying to move in that direction, both with small businesses. We did a, a big fund last year with the Power Up Fund, part of Hispanics and Philanthropy. That was no strings attached, cash one way out. The results that we've seen from that on small business impact has been disruptive, has been impressive. We're now doing the same thing with entrepreneurs. We just announced two weeks ago uh, the Google for Startups uh, Latino Founders Fund. That's going to be a $5 million fund, non-dilutive cash to, to entrepreneurs, not just the cash, but also the community building, the skills component, so like the full suite of wraparound supports. I think that's important. I think we should be displaying and putting out there more cash with no strings attached to it, one. Two, to Lily's point around apprenticeships, um, I think we also need to be really thoughtful around how we don't leave out the individuals that are not pursuing a traditional pathway for education. Opportunity at Work has this great framing they use called STARS, right? Individuals that are skilled through alternate routes, STARS. And these individuals are folks that don't have a four-year degree, they're not gonna go to a community college, it's just not the right fit for them based on their financial obligations, their familial obligations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so how do we ensure that these individuals, there's 80 million of these individuals, by the, by the way, in this country right now, and a high percentage of those individuals are Latinos. How do we make sure these individuals have equitable access and equitable pathways to upper mobility, to jobs in the economy, in the digital economy? And how are we empowering those individuals? What are, what are the pathways, apprenticeships being one of them, employer-backed credentials being another? How can we keep getting creative there to ensure that those 80 million stars are not gonna get left behind? That's something else we need to be paying attention to. Excellent, thank you, and I uh, love opportunity at work, so I'm glad that you brought them into the fold. Um, so we do have a couple of questions and only about 10 minutes left, maybe. Um, so we're gonna try to uh, combine some of them because there are some uh, that are thematically the same. I think you know we've spent a lot of time here uh, really focusing on either new businesses or entrepreneurs that are pretty tech savvy or know the VC route, right? Or that, that ecosystem. We have a couple of questions from the audience who are interested in, for those that are not tech savvy, who are not going to be tech savvy, but do not also have the resources or the capacity to hire an SEO, to hire a CIO, what are some, um, what are some places they can turn to? I think we've mentioned a little bit the need for um, local government and maybe chambers to step up here, but um, are there any other resources that you would um, point to for business owners that are, that are just not, that's just not gonna be where they, where they spend their time, so they need the extra help. So any, any resources or um, organizations that you guys could point to I think would be helpful for the audience. Definitely, I think, I mean, grow with Google, so I'll, I'll say a story. <laughs> my mom, actually, my mom, I told her to go and check out uh, Grow with Google in Espanol, because mm -hmm. I, my mom got this place out of her uh, job as a medical assistant and technician, because her company moved from doing paper building to 
the billing automated, right? And so for me, it's also another lived experience. So actually I had her start to take a look and, 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 and have her be educated. So I was actually gonna share with you. <laughs> Uh, but my mom is doing it, I'm doing it as well. Even though I'm an engineer, I continue to upscale myself every, every time. Um, and so some resources that I think are important are um, checking out some of those programs like Grow with Google, but there are a lot. And I think, that, I think that's one of the things that the SBA is also working on with their navigator. Um, the challenge though, I would say that it's, there's also a cultural issue and I'll share a mm -hmm. brief story when in Oakland, when the World Central Kitchen came to help a lot of our um, uh, entrepreneurs who are business owners, specifically restaurants, right? There were some restaurants that they just did not want to uh, follow some of the COVID protocols. They didn't want to, they didn't know how to do it. And I think there was this part where, unfortunately, because there was this resistance, they didn't participate in those programs that allowed them to continue to operate and continue to generate. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the other entrepreneurs that we found, especially out in Fruitvale, their cash economy. And so they're like, I don't need to do this. I'm still gonna open my stores. We had, we had, and that's the reality, right? Mm -hmm. There are people who are like, I'm still gonna go do business because I need to feed my family. And so I do think that there are very, it's important that all these tools that we are mentioning are still very culturally relevant. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the part where I see the folks who are here from all the different cities. You are the resources, you are the solutions because you know your community best. And we can give you all the tools and resources, but if there's nobody helping them adopt it in a way that makes them feel helpful, that they can actually um, uh, see the results, they're not going to do it. And so I think that there's, I, I think that we have to take a look at um, how relevant are the tools, how realistic is it. Mm -hmm. um, I can give you ten links, <laughs> but who's, how is, how is that getting into the hands of the people that really need it? I think, what language? I think one thing too, and this is a practice, um, it's reverse mentorship. So actually having somebody from a younger generation work with mm -hmm. someone that's an older generation and start make, not getting people a little bit more used to these kinds of, of things, right? Access to Yelp or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, yeah. you know, Dropbox box, you know, these, these other things that, that, you know, our kids and their kids, I guess, are starting to like really use and leverage all the time. And I think, especially if it's Latino entrepreneurs, you know, they're going to be a, a lot less intimidated than trying to, you know, pick up the phone right. and call someone, some stranger to come in. And, you know, and sometimes it might need to be a little bit of a family affair, right? Mm -hmm. Where you encourage your mom to, hey, mom, there's this resource and, you know, check it out. You know, it's, it's in Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, maybe, yeah, more of a little practice. Those are great. Um, I, again, we have only a couple minutes left, but I, I do want to bring up this question, which I thought was really um, interesting, is the role that community colleges could be playing mm -hmm. in this? And I know we've talked a lot about um, uh, the, the, high, the, the institutions that are normally tapped for talent, uh, but I, you know, what's interesting is there are a lot, I mean, there are a lot of community colleges to be leveraged at this point, and there's no clear engagement um, in some areas and particularly areas that are not already in a tech center. Mm -hmm. um, is, I would be curious to hear from any one of you maybe some success stories or examples of, um, of that type of partnership with that type of institution um, that's often you know, not thought of as a one place to go to for a talent. I love community colleges. <laughs> I think they're the gems that we need that have been sorely underinvested. But we also have to be real that there's a lot of politics of how when they, there is funding that gets her, how does it get, actually get applied and, and ultimately reach the, the, the talent that we're trying to reach. Um, those are really where a lot of the Latinos, especially when we, when we think about just in California, right? That's where a lot of, like somebody mentioned, I think it was Raul mentioned, that's where the, like most of us, are right or have started um, and, and when I was undergrad actually USC had one of the best programs for uh, transfers so the Stanford people don't know that but yes that's possible people transfer into Stanford and I, I actually some models that I started to see that make me uh, positive the model that you were just sharing right now where you have um, students who are in community colleges also taking apprenticeships but part of their programs or taking different types of tech tech uh, classes are actually helping small businesses get upgraded, right? Mm -hmm. There's also opportunities where I've seen in, uh, in the East Bay where cybersecurity is another program that's starting. Um, we've seen more of these 
tech strategies, but we have to make sure that also the employers are there because it's also a funding issue. Totally. And so we're, mm -hmm. we're spinning all of our students, and Raul mentioned that stat, that it takes like six years for somebody to graduate. That tech landscape in six years has drastically changed. If we take a look with just the last two years for all of us here, how fast that's changed, we really need more of these uh, startups to also work with the community colleges. I think that there is a way to integrate different programming and augmented. And I do think that we have to get out of the mentality of like, oh, well, if they do it, I can't. This is a time for integrated strategies. Whether you're a CBO on the ground, you need to have a tech strategy now. Whether you're a community colleges, you got to start taking a look at who's in your administration, who's, what talent do you have that can bring that knowledge to you? So I think it's, it's really an opportunity to relook at the staffing we look at the material um, and start bringing fresh stuff. And I think to, there's, there's a lot, and this is again, the opportunity. Mm -hmm. How do we take these problems into the opportunities for us to seize? And this is where we know our community best on the ground. And so I hope to see much more, <laughs> the entrepreneurs here bringing up even more ideas and, and collaborating with their community colleges. And you know, the magnitude of the, program, the problem is so large. So this, this is not a zero sum game. It's not, yeah. we're all gonna go in on community colleges or bust or four year degrees or bust or alternative yeah. routes. Like, it, all of these options need to be on the table and we should be investing into all of them collectively. You know, I think community colleges, there's, there's a tremendous, they're, they're tremendously underinvested. Mm -hmm. We need to be doing more with community colleges about strengthening their, their, their backbone. Google has been, invest, we've been investing in, in um, community colleges for years. We've been, we're now at 100 community colleges with mm -hmm. Google-supported tech-oriented curriculum because we know that there's a tremendous amount of BIPOC talent in community colleges that we need to be better serving. We're also engaging with other BIPOC institutions, four-year institutions like HBCUs, mm -hmm. HSIs, pumping both cash. We have a Googler in residence program where we're actually embedding Google engineers into these schools to help diffuse into their CS departments the type of expertise that are needed to be able to become a software engineer at a place like Google. So these SSIs like FIU, like the, the various HBCUs can ultimately best prepare their talent for, for that pipeline to tech companies. I think all these solutions need to be, be on the table for us. Yes, I like that. That gives us a lot of options to work with. So we have two minutes uh, left and I really wanna take this last two minutes to give our panelists the opportunity to give me 30 seconds of, you have a <laughs> wonderful set of um, an army of people ready to go. What is the thing that you want them to consider to take into tomorrow's workshops and, and, and really think through and hopefully execute on? Who wants to go first? Raul, I'm gonna put you on the spot. I love it. No, <laughs> I think there's a desperate need um, so quick background, I come from private investing and then now in philanthropy and the nature of the work we're doing in, in funding we're doing in Miami has put me in really close kind of in the middle of academia, essentially. Um, and, and the gulf between academia, academic administrators, whether at four or two year universities and the private market and the speed of the private market, it has left me dizzy. Um, there's an, a desperate need for entrepreneurs, for business leaders to speak honestly and candidly to universities around curriculum, around how to access great talent. Um, universities do not think in terms of delighting the user or the customer. The customer in this case is both the student and the company trying to hire. Any truth you can speak to these, to these universities that help them develop better systems for how they can keep curriculum modern to, to Lily's point about it can't, you can't wait six years because like what you learned is, is outdated. That keeps curriculum modern and fresh and contemporary and, and also pushes them to build better systems for how they place great talent into companies for these apprenticeships and internships and, and, and career tracks. I think the private market has a critical role to play in holding a mirror up to academia, to academic institutions and saying, hey, it's not working. It's not working for us. It's not working for the students. We got to build better systems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, Marcella. Um, I just, I guess, the analogy that uh, having a, a business, uh, being an entrepreneur, it's like having a child. You have a baby, and if someone, Google or anyone, gives me a hundred thousand dollars, here you go for their college fund. Great. Um, you still have to figure out how to raise that child within yeah. the environment that mm -hmm. exists, and it's an ever-changing environment. You weren't born learning how to raise kids. Uh, so you need the right people, resources around you, tap into them all along that journey, and the objective is to set them up to be self-sustaining individuals so they can go off and create you know, additional wealth for generations to come. And so you know, if we can figure out a way to help businesses 
grow and shepherd them through the entirety of the process. Um, and again, I, I have my kids and they do spreadsheets and budgets and we look at it, we review it because you know they are now owning, not owning, but um, they have their own paychecks now and they're making their own decisions and so it's important for them to do that. So I think you know, if you just look at businesses as a baby, <laughs> what happens next? All right, Lily. I, I would say that um, you know that, that stat of like the current representation we have of Latinx, it would take 40 years for us to, at that pace, to reach parity. That's a whole generation. We don't have time for that. Uh -huh. Don't even let me get into the stat of Latinas equal pay day, which is like a whole different <laughs> generation of generations. And so to all that to say is like, this is the urgent moment. And I think specifically when we take a look at the multiracial component of Latinx, with everything that it embodies, don't let anybody tell you that we're too much or too complicated or too hard to solve. Mm -hmm. That's the opportunity. And I want to make sure that we're also uplifting the importance of having this aggregated data to take a look at our Afro-Latinx, Asian-Latinx, somos de todo. And so I just want to make sure that we embrace all of that because, again, that's where the innovation is going to come. And so I want to just making sure that as you go into tomorrow, you're thinking about the, the whole complexity that we have, and also one last plug, right, because we're in DC, we got to make sure that we're in civically engaged, but we're also taking roles in public uh, service. I volunteer my time as a redistricting commissioner for Oakland. How did I get in there? Latino Community Foundation helped me get there. And so I think that's the power of the network of how we have to get create opportunities for each other because we're all, we need to be in all the rooms and we need to be advocating for all those different changes. And so I think it's the nation's imperative to make sure that the Latinx community and everything that it represents is really upheld and it's prioritized. And we have to do it in solidarity with our black community because mm -hmm. we have Afro-Latinx, we have everything. And so I think we have to find that moment of unity, of really uplifting those that have been disproportionately left behind because of the systemic racism that a lot of the systems that we're trying to fix were built upon. Mm -hmm. And so until we have a real dialogue about how to create those new systems, we're always gonna be chasing those holes. And so I really wanna uh, call to action for the ones that have access to capital. This is the time to be investing in this new, really equitable uh, new systems, but you have to get the people who are being impacted the most. We have to start with the community and meet the community where they're at. All right, thank you. And Hector, I have you give the last word, but it's going to be a fast word. So. Fast word. <laughs> I'll talk fast. You know, I think we're in a pivotal moment in time in history, um, in this country's history, where we're coming out of a global pandemic. We're coming out of a deep, deep, dark moment in, in our national history. And I think we can, it's up to us to either view, view this through a tragic lens or through the lens of an opportunity. And I think we can decide collectively through the dialogue that's happening in this room, so through the dialogue that's happening in this space that's been created in this gathering, to rally our collective voices and leverage those collective voices to demand change. Demand that in this moment in time, it's our opportunity to rebuild an economy that's different than the economy that we enter the pandemic into, right? An economy that's more equitable, that has, that has greater pathways to opportunity, greater pathways to upper mobility. And it's up to all of us in this room and beyond these walls to design that, that economy of tomorrow. So my rallying cry to you all, my, what, I, what I beg of you is, Let's not let this moment go to waste. Let's maximize it and let's make the most of it. All right, well, I thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you all.